afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. So how was your morning? Excellent. So mine was great. Thanks for asking. I had a great time in the Hall of Resources with our business partners. I walked around. I got this wonderful little tag that matches my outfit. Isn't that nice? Got a nice bag that matches my outfit. Some great candy from PC App, I know. Along with some great resources, information to help me when I go back to my school. So please, let's give a round of applause for all of our business partners one more time. I'm eating this later. All right, at this time, I have the great honor to, of introducing the afternoon general session, Transforming Facilities with Student Success by inviting APA's very own Executive Vice President, Lander Medlin, to the stage. Lander! Woo! I pushed it. Advance the slide. There we go. I'm telling you, every time I hear that song, I can't think of anything to do except click my fingers, tap my toes, jump up and dance, and be happy. And I saw you were starting to do that too. I had to do a little coaxing. But I have a case in point here, and it happens to be my colleague, Holly Judd, who's sitting over here. So Holly and I are at the APA 2014 100th Anniversary Conference in San Diego. We walked into an empty ballroom. We're on this side. The AV team's way over there. We're talking logistics. And all of a sudden, the AV guys decide that they are going to play happy and boom, sound check, and it comes up. We both looked at each other, and within seconds, did we not, Holly? Within seconds, ran over, threw our stuff down, and started doing that and having the grandest time. Boy, we were just having a great time. And you know, frankly, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today, but I'm going to link it to some stuff, OK? So we're going to talk about why we do what we do and not so much about what we do and how we do it, all right? So we're going to get at the why. But the opening lyrics are fascinating to me. The opening lyrics, if you catch them or if you have grandchildren, raise your hand if you have grandchildren. Huh? Okay, a few of you. How about great-grandchildren? Ron, get your hand up. That's my husband. Yeah, he's real happy about that. So, yeah, the opening lyrics say, it might seem crazy what I'm talking about. It might seem crazy what I'm talking about. But what if you felt that way every day? What if your staff felt that way every day? What if your students felt that way? every day. Well, frankly, I'm not here just to sell happiness, but maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm here to sell the idea that you matter, that your facilities matter in enriching stu the student experience. If you're going to ultimately align facilities with student success outcomes, you got to sell the student experience, right? And that's what we're going to do. So what you do, and you must, and you should, and you absolutely have to contribute to student success on the part of your institutions. Now, we heard this morning that it's all about people, and that's you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So when I look at this thing and I think about 
happiness, student experience. I think they're inextricably linked. How about you? Huh? They are. They really are. But by definition, they're really difficult to define, are they not? And so if I think about defining that, hmm, gosh, well, I'll give you this example. The Supreme Court justices were trying to define pornography. Well, they were having a difficult time. And one of the Supreme Court justices said, I know it when I see it. <laughs> right? Well, that's what I'm talking about here. I know it when I see it. So let's just connect this now and carry it through to the institution's definition of student success. If you have one, I bet you if I asked you to raise your hands and tell me if you had one, you probably don't even know. But maybe after this session, you'll go back and find out. And so if you were to look at that definition, I bet you it would, it would do the following. It would either be practical, measurable, tangible, right? But at the same time, it is abstract. It's intangible. It's elusive. You know it when you see it. Maybe even you know it when you feel it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I, I really think it's important for you to be able to connect with this whole topic of student experience, student success, and happiness. So I'm going to start with happiness. Gosh, happiness is so fun. I guess you can tell that from me, right? Well, you know, it's not just some wild-haired idea that I imagined up here. There's research on this. There are books about this. There are all kinds of information about happiness because I think it is inextricably linked to, student, ex, to the student experience. But CEOs of companies actually get it. And they get it so much. I've, I've got a wonderful YouTube video clip. It's a, it's a pretty short clip. And I want you to hear, Mary, where are you? Raise your hand. Mary Vosovich really likes Illy coffee. Forget Starbucks from her standpoint. Am I right? Yes, she does. Illy Coffee. Well, the CEO of Illy Coffee, you're going to love this, has a video clip and it says, Why happiness comes first at Illy Coffee. Let's watch. Because we, uh, we depend on uh, our work and because we dedicate so much time to working, really the working, uh, let's say, environment is really one of the main determinants of, uh, of happiness. Focusing first on the people's motivation and happiness might create a kind of a spontaneous productivity which uh, is part of the solution for improving performance of the company. I try to instill happiness in the working environment very first, never, never, never violate people's dignity. The, the fundamental uh, goal for one person is to uh, self-actualize, self-actualization which is done through work, basically. Work and social life, you know. But it's also, which is even more important, is how you work, in which environment you work. How much the working environment engage you and empowers you in uh, taking advantage of your uh, resources, your intelligence, your competence, and your ethical values. People want to be, want to count, you know. The day you feel that you count, in the organization that you work for, then you feel accomplished, uh, self-actualized, and happy. All right. He said a lot there. Did he just be willy-nilly about it, touchy-feely? No. He talked about performance. He talked about productivity. He talked about all the things that you want in your organization. So why aren't we stressing that? Where's Mike Johnson? Well, is Mike Johnson in the room? I might have to hit him. Yeah, Mike Johnson talked about how important the word environment is in the Thought Leaders Symposium. He said the environment is the critical word. You go back to John Jensen's talk yesterday, and he talked about what do you do? If you answered that question, hopefully you didn't say, what do I do? Let's see, it's the services, it's the, oh, and by the way, I deliver it this way. No, it's about why you do what you do. And he said the environment is the critical part here. So why ask you, what environment, what culture, what attitude are you creating or cultivating in your organizations? Hmm? 
Are you equalizing the very nature of work across all employees that their work matters and that everything that gets done there is important? Are you doing that? And so I would, I would, I would ask you, I went back um, last year to the um, session that I did on engagement. And I talked about, you like that, don't you, Pete? You got all excited. Engagement, that was your theme, yeah. So I talked about engagement, and I used the metaphor of music, and I used symphony, a symphony. A symphony needs all types of instruments, doesn't it? Yeah, all types of instruments. And we in our organizations need all types of people to deliver to perfection. Our organizations are no different. So are you, are, are you recognizing the contribution of every person that works for you? I'm talking every person. Do they feel seen by you? Do they matter? Now we know a lot about the look and feel. You ponder that for a moment. We know about a lot about the uh, the look. I will say, um, of our campuses. Jensen talked about it yesterday, but several people talked about the positive impact of facilities on the recruitment and retention of students. Right? Yeah, we've got data on that. Carnegie uh, study in 1988, 99. Steve will correct me later. Yeah, and then in 2006. That, those studies tell us that there is a direct link between the positive support of facilities and recruitment and retention of students. But that that's the look of the campus, the look, the sense of place and space. So bricks and mortars matter, folks. Your role matters. But I'm here to suggest to you that in this fiercely competitive online educational delivery set of systems, can we become obsolete? Yeah, we can, and we need to pay attention to that. So I want to give you some things to think about. I would posit that what we do goes way beyond just the look. I would suggest to you that it's about the feel as well and that you have a huge opportunity for a contribution. As a matter of fact, it's about that connect connectivity, the welcoming atmosphere that you create at the University of Arizona campus, right? Hotter than heck there, but it's a welcoming atmosphere. That's right. And uh, how about those inviting neighborhoods, learning neighborhoods? How about those collection points that you create so that students can learn and gain knowledge? They have that sense of connection. You know when it just hums. You know it when you feel it, right? That's what you know. So you know a lot about the look. Well, what about your role with respect to feel? I want to go there a little bit. The CEO of Illy Coffee. Did you catch a few of his other lines? He said, attitude. So I look at each and every one of you, leaders, managers, supervisors in your organizations. It starts with you. It starts with you. It starts with you in terms of your attitude about your role and your contribution. Because then that shouldn't trickle down. It should be stated to your employees, to your staff because their role and their contribution becomes super important. And John Jensen talked about, and he used an illustration that I would like to say again, just to reemphasize several points. And that is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a little bit differently. Leonardo da Vinci was walking along, inspecting many of his projects, and he looked over at one gentleman and he says, so what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying bricks. He nodded, moved on came upon the next guy who was doing the same tasks. And he said, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a cathedral, right? You heard that yesterday. Which person and which staff person would say that their job mattered? Which one had the attitude that their role matters and that what they do is really important, right? Wouldn't you want the second guy? Because the second guy knew it. 
He understood that. And I'm telling you, it forms the basis for an extraordinary student experience when people think they're building cathedrals rather than just laying bricks. So I ask you that. Are you just laying bricks? Or are you building a cathedral? I hope it's the other. So what we offer really goes beyond just the look. So I want to give you a little bit different story. This is about Bill. Bill was a custodian at a famous law school. And this is a true story, by the way. And he had, a, uh, I'd say, well over 40 years before he decided it was time to retire. And so Bill uh, decided he submitted his papers, and the folks sent out a notice of a retirement party. Do you know that across the country, lawyers, judges, all across the country responded, and they wanted to come. They had to move the venue. Oh, Suzanne, they had to up the food and beverage. What can I say? Yeah, it got crazy. But they did it because it was such an overwhelming response. Well, now we got to limit speeches. Yeah. So the first gentleman comes up and he says, second semester sophomore, I failed the exam that I thought, that's it, I'm out. That was the most critical exam, I'm done, not going to happen. Failed it. Comes back, Bill noticed right away. He looked so down. He just, he, he set him aside. He talked to him a little bit. Talked to him the next day. Do you know he talked him off that ledge of, I'm going to quit? And he said, I graduated with honors. Second gentleman said, end of the summer, two weeks before the semester was supposed to begin in my junior year, he said, my father passed away. Bill noticed. I was pretty despondent, pretty depressed, pretty upset. I couldn't quite get it together. Do you know that Bill extended himself in such a way that that gentleman said, Bill became my surrogate father, and he said, today, I still think of him that way. The third and final gentleman came up. He said, I was sick. Really sick, didn't know what I had. I hadn't been out of my room for like two days. Hadn't been walking the campus, Bill noticed. And he looked, he thought, I don't know what's going on, but I gotta go find that guy. He came in, he came into my dorm room, he looked at me and he said, you are not doing well, I need to get, he scooped me up, took me to the hospital. I was diagnosed with spinal meningitis and he said to that, to this day, he saved my life. Now, was this just Bill's job? Last time I looked in your job descriptions, I didn't see that. Where's Steve Gilsdorf? He's got to be around somewhere. Where's Steve? Is he in the room? Steve Gilsdorf and I were having, he's, he's the, oh, I won't say it in front of everybody, no. Yeah, Steve is a great guy. And he was talking to me yesterday, and he said, do you know that our custodians, because he's in building services, and he said, our custodians are our front line of defense. He said, our custodians actually have, have kept students from doing really horrible things like committing suicide. I mean, let's get real, folks. From doing things that were, would have been the worst nightmare. They have seen it. They're there, they know what to do. So what do you, why do I tell you that? It's not Bill's job description, but Bill could see, he could feel what was needed in that moment. Are you in the moment? I'm in the moment, I don't know about you, yeah. <laughs> Are you in the moment? Are your staff in the moment? Do they feel empowered to be in the moment? Or are you so worried about whether they're getting their job done? You know, Bill was an unbelievable, he got, exceptional evaluations. This was just what he did. This is what we would love to have everyone do, isn't it? Now granted, all your folks are very diverse. I get it, okay? Yep, they come from all different vantage points, all aspects. And I hope so because they mirror the student body. Well, you come at things differently, they come at things differently, uh, sort of like this. 
Awesome, right? Well, you try everything. <laughs> Will you get out there? Okay, so uh, have you seen any of these on your campus? I didn't say they were animals, okay. I'm uh, not being stinky. Yeah, I, uh, my point is that we're all so different, and we don't always recognize that, especially in our workforce. And it's challenging, isn't it? It's challenging. But guess what? The student body is just the same way. And it's just as challenging, and it's even more. But we need to recognize that and get on with it. Because the last 25 years were about student access, meaning butt in the door, okay? Let's get them in. But then we sort of like lost track of them. Now it's about student success, meaning we not only get them in the door, but we herd them through. We want to get them out. We want them to be successful when they actually get out. Now, there are a lot of, you know, there's some factors that we should take a look at when, when we're talking about student success. And our senior institutional officers, our stakeholders, will say that these are factors that contribute. Okay, let's look at them. You can see them. They're the usual suspects. Do they look like what I said to you earlier? Some are practical, measurable, tangible, and others are abstract and intangible and a bit elusive, right? Get our hands around. Well, I found it interesting when I was preparing for this, I got my hands on just recently the 2017 American College President's Study. And I went through that study. And what I found is that the first three factors, student retention, graduation rates, academic achievement, are now the preferred performance metrics. Let's take it a little further. You may not believe me. Here's what they said. Presidents are prioritizing assessment and measurement related to student success and equitable outcomes over other markers of performance and prestige. Think about that, folks. That's huge. And it's over. In the report, it said it's over U.S. News and World Report rankings. Yeah. And it's over research grants, competitive dollars numbers. It's over tuition fees cost numbers. That's significant. But furthermore, let's look at this quote. Come on. There we are. For presidents to guide their institutions through a process of innovation, they are doubling down on student success, folks, and postgraduate outcomes for an increasingly diverse population. And this isn't just the presidential associations. This is chief information officers. You go to their website, you will see it's all about student success. Go to every association that supports student affairs types, you will see student success. Go to APA, you will see student success. The, yes, woohoo, give yourself a round of applause, yeah. So here we are, We're in, we are ahead of the game with the Thought Leaders monograph. It's critically important, they're doubling down. Is it compelling or what? But guess what, I think your contribution goes way deeper. Why? Because I would venture to say that you touch every student and every stakeholder every day on your campus. Either you do or your facilities do, right? So is this experience, one of your experiences, when making that connection? <laughs> Oh! 
Uh, what do you think, Jack Colby? Is that your experience? <laughs> yeah, there are a few of you that would feel like that guy going to pull out. You can tell I'm a grandmother. Actually, I'm a great-grandmother. But I like these. They have great messages, don't they? It is a little bit silly. But frankly, I ask you now, and more importantly, how are you touching them? How are you engaging them? How are you making them feel? Do they really matter? At the end of the day, are they happy? Yeah, it's a stretch, maybe, huh? So let me ask you, are you happy doing what you do? Where's Mark Webb? Is he in the room? Mark, I know you're in here. There you are. You sat up on this stage today. You, along with the rest of your colleagues, raise your hands, everybody that was up on this stage today, and you gave your passion. You did too, Eric, and you talked about loving it, right? You love what you do. So I'm asking you, do you love what you do? Well, you know, Ron and I were newlyweds. And uh, I was working at the Department of Physical Plant at the Use of Mercy Maryland College Park, and uh, my, fine j my husband's over here to my to my right, your left, yes. And he turns to me one morning and he says, why are you so happy to go to work? And I looked at him and I said, uh, aren't you? <laughs> Isn't everybody? <laughs> Don't you love your work? And he knows it's true. And he looked at me and he goes, yeah, I know, I love my work. Yeah, but I didn't recognize it that way. It hadn't really sunk in. I'm asking you to let it sink in because it changes the very attitude of you and everybody around you when you go to work, doesn't it? And I said, furthermore, Ron, they engage me. They make me feel what I do matters. How many could claim that your folks feel, feel what they do matters? That's super important, isn't it? Yeah, so I'm hoping you'll actually think about that. So you see, student, uh, this happiness thing actually is linked to something I'm going to now use and it'll really make you uncomfortable, and that's feelings. Yeah, let's go to feeling. Why not? Because I think happiness and that feeling actually matter. We talked initially about worried that we might be obsolete when it comes to online delivery systems, well, guess what? If we could be, then don't we want those bricks and mortar to really matter? Don't we want to, that feeling to be pervasive such that everyone feels like you are delivering an invaluable, tangible, that you can't get online? Can you get what you do online? You better tell me no, because you're the bricks and mortar. But you need to demonstrate that every day. That needs to be part of what you do. It's the atmosphere. It's that whole environment. And so I'm looking around the room, and I'm thinking, hmm, did you buy that suit? Did you buy that suit? How about a dress? Did you buy that dress when you bought it? You bought it because the way you feel in it, right? I'm feeling good. And did you buy that car? Tell me about that car you bought. Somebody was talking to me about the car I drive and do I like because it drives, goes fast. I said, no, I like the way it handles, but I like the way I feel in it, right? So you buy that car because I like the way you feel in it. And how about that college? They choose it because the way they feel about it. Yeah, look, the way they feel about that campus, that becomes really, really important. So I've gotten all emotional on you. Guess what? Is Norm in the room now? Where's Norm? To find Norm. Norm's the why guy. Ah, there you are, Norm. You knew I was going to get there. It's all about the why. They don't come for what you do and how you do it. They do it. Why you do it. That core motive. It's why. And that's the emotional side, whether we like it or not. That's the emotional decision making. They must choose that feeling, that environment that you actually create and that atmosphere, but they come for that reason. So you ultimately invite them to partake, to choose that experience, right? Okay, so I know it gets messy. Well, let's take a Real look. life is messy. We all have limitations. 
we all make mistakes, which means, hey, glass half full, we all have a lot in common. And the more we try to understand one another, the more exceptional each of us will be. Yeah, it's still a little messy, isn't it? But did you get the end part there? But what we can do, it could be actually exceptional and extraordinary. Absolutely it can, and that's what I want you to think about. There is an old Talmudic saying. It says, what comes from the heart enters the heart. Let me say it again. What comes from the heart enters the heart. Doesn't work any other way. So it takes caring to ignite caring. It takes empathy to ignite empathy. And it takes happiness to ignite happiness. It doesn't work any other way. So let's go back to that pesky definition of student success again. There we are. So uh, have you asked at your institution, do you have a definition for student success? Do you know if your institution has a definition? Go back and find out. And if so, if you do know and they have one, are you aligning your organization's resources with student success so that they can actually achieve that goal? You're going to be much more part of core. Now, thought leaders did some really cool work on this. And they looked at a role that facilities professionals could take in sort of thinking about student success. Let's take a look at those. In aligning facilities resources with institutional student success, let's pick some. First, the first one, safe, accessible, clean, and functional spaces. Oh, that sounds like I'm at the Olympics and I'm a ice skating. And I'm doing the technical compulsories. I got to do them perfect, right? I gotta execute flawlessly. Because if I don't, I don't get to go to the creative, you know, skating part. I'm out. Well, the same goes for you. Those are the basics. We gotta get those done. We gotta minimize distractions. We gotta really limit and reduce the friction. That's what we have to do. Take, I'll talk about technology in a second, but do you understand? Have you done a needs assessment of your pedagogy? Maker spaces, I love that. Someone said that in a session um, yesterday about maker spaces. Are you creating learning neighborhoods? Are you creating environments in which people just connect and collect? How about living learning labs? Your, your organizations are walking living, well, they're not walking, but they are living learning labs that you can demonstrate sustainability to these students. And let me suggest that internships, super important. If you don't know yet that internships, it's, the, it's now considered the number one factor in a student getting their first job. And if we're talking about student suggest, success, when I looked at those factors, wasn't that important? Okay, can you and your organizations deliver internships? How many of you, raise your hand, are delivering student internships? Raise your hand. Look at all those folks, awesome. I want the next time I ask you that question, I want everybody's hands to go up. Because every one of you and every part of your organization can be delivering internships. And I just said, look how important it is. Really got to do it, folks. You, you have perfect opportunity. And talk about a connection now to the students. Talk about now a connection to academic and to the, uh, to the academic mission. You've got to be in alignment. So why care? Why does it matter? Hmm? I think it really matters. And I'll give you some. Thomas Friedman wrote a book. Where is Michael O'Connor? There you are, okay, he's read it. Don, where are you? You read it. Okay, several of you, I wrote an article in the January, February uh, magazine, a uh, facilities manager magazine. And in that article, it talks about this, thank you for being late. All right, Friedman, you got me. Yeah, well, you know how, Often I am on time, not, right. So thank you for being late, but it's really the important thing is the subtitle. And the subtitle says, an optimist guide to thriving in an age of accelerations. And what's he talking about? Age of accelerations, he says that we are living amidst um, a few game changers and they are accelerating and let's take a look at those game changers. Yeah, there are three driving forces that are in play. Technology is the first one. This is where computing speed and power are doubling every 18 to 24 months. And my informatics guys may say it's even worse than that, right? Because it is all the components. But, but let's just center on that. So hence, 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. 
Think about them apples. Go to globalization. Globalization, and I'm talking about markets and media. Okay, both. This is, and uh, David Hamwork, raise your hand. Yep, David is over there. He taught me something at the board meeting the other day. He says where it's not just people are connected, everything is connected. And you heard in that session, do you remember the backdrop that Marcus brought up? Was it making your eyeballs crazy? Yeah, it's amazing how much data is actually being collected. Yeah, it's amazing. So hence, anyone can impact everyone, anytime, everywhere. Environment. Friedman talks about uh, climate change and biodiversity loss. And that's where we, people, humans, are not just a part of nature anymore. We are becoming a force of, in, and on nature. Hence, we may be shifting this wonderful planet of ours from friend to foe. Okay, well, it gets worse. They're all three. <laughs> yeah, don't you love it when she does this? It gets worse because all three of these driving forces, technology, globalization, and environment, are actually accelerating, simultaneously interdependent and exponentially. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. Simultaneously, exponentially, and interdependently. And, and what I'm talking about here is the, the, the fact that humans act, adapt, think from a linear mindset, okay? Where velocity, time, and distance are linear. So example, I put my foot on the gas pedal and people say I don't take it off, but I do. So I put my foot on the gas pedal and I take it off. So I go faster and I go slower. That is linear, right? It's all that is, faster, slow, action, reaction. Now, exponential, boy, exponential rate and pace of change uh, is actually occurring and having mm, quite a different set of, of results and consequences. So let's take a look at that. When I consider that, when I think of the, go with me, slide, there we go, a single grain of rice. Let's talk about that one. That's the legend of the famous king who was so impressed with the inventor of the game of chess that he offered him any reward. And the inventor says, oh, what I would, I would like enough rice to feed my family. And he says, okay, shall be done. How much do you want? And the inventor looked back at him and he says, well, I would like you to place one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard and then two grains on the next and four grains on the next and twice as many with each subsequent square. Well, the king immediately agreed without realizing that 63 inches of doubling on a chessboard yields a fantastically huge number. 18 quintillion grains of rice. Did I say quintillion? Do we even know what quintillion is? 18 quintillion grains of rice. So, exponential, that's the rate and pace, yeah. That's the power of exponential change. It's crazy. And so did it get worse? Yeah. Look at my little line at the bottom. Do you know that we just entered the second half of the chessboard? 63, do the math. So we are rocking. And what's the impact? I go, yikes! Wah! Yeah, what's the impact of that? Well, we're transforming every aspect of modern life, of modern society. And on top of that, the feeling, I know you hate that. The feeling is one of dislocation. I didn't say disruption, I said dislocation. And dislocation is important because humans cannot fathom how to adapt in this kind of environment. So that's why you're feeling it dislocated, right? So as you think about that, humans cannot fathom how to adapt because the world is being changed uncomfortably. That's what we're in the middle of. And living in the midst of these age of accelerations has shifted, is shifting, will shift everything we know and do in, in the higher education landscape. You thought that we were, oh, oh, okay, we're not going to play. We don't need to be in that. Yeah, well, we are. 
and we, can't, we have to learn to adapt as well. But I believe education can survive. It can actually thrive if through innovation, reimagination, redefining, redefining what it is we do with our, in our systems. And I believe that each and every one of you in this room can contribute to that in a big way because I think you can reinvent the very nature and importance of the human experience. What I've been talking about. Yeah, bricks and mortar, sense of place and space. Even better, all those interactions that you have an opportunity to deliver. I told you, every day touching every stakeholder, right? Think about the power that you have. If you will focus on connectivity, creating community, creative collisions, all colliding into neighborhoods, learning neighborhoods, and actually creating neighborhoods such that they network. You're networking here. I want you to create those in your or at your institutions. Networks where you physically give them an opportunity for their minds to now be enabled, enabled to, to uh, innovate, to create and collaborate. Ah, oh, that word, collaborate. I love that word, collaborate. We all think we know what the word means, don't we? We think uh, Jack taught me, he says, well, I called the meeting. Well, they didn't come, I'm sorry, but didn't you tell me that, Jack? I called the meeting, that, and, and he said, that's not collaboration, that's not what it's about. Collaboration is very different, because collaboration, if we understood the word, the true meaning of the word, we could see how the very nature of our interactions and how we relate to one another would change. They might be happier and more meaningful engagements, right? So I want you to do this for me. I want you to think of the following people. You can take a look at those. Think of them. Three people in your life whom you most like. Two people who've had, my lovely colleagues over here who can never see because I'm in the way, I didn't say your worst boss, I said your best boss, okay? Come on, think of these people, person who inspires you, three favorite coworkers, an acquaintance. So think about that, right? Think about it. Now, as you think on those, I want you to further think about why you like them. Why do you like them so much? Why do you like those people that you pick so much? Why do you respond so well? Why do you work harder for them? Why do you respect them? And in some cases, depending on who you picked, why do you revere them? I think that what both have in, all those people have in common, you matter. You matter. Because they see you, they engage you as a, 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 a person. Oh my word, I'm a person. Yeah, as a person. One who has needs and desires and insecurities and fears and hopes, right? A person. A person of worth, a person of value. Wow. A person who actually is seen. You feel seen by them. You matter to them. You actually have a name unique to you, and they know it. Think about that. So it's a way of seeing, seeing, seeing that this collaboration, is this thing could be really different. Because, you know, the biggest lever of change is not a change in self-belief. It's a fundamental change in the way we see and engage others and regard our connections to, uh, with and our obligations to others. It's the way we see and regard them as people. You know, the funny thing is, I think it's really sort of interesting, but the funny thing is that if we will do the hard work of collaborating this way, we actually will achieve our results. We'll actually achieve their results. And you know what's even better? We'll probably achieve even better results, more enhanced, enriched results, because we engaged in collective dialogue. We actually got other people's perspectives wide open. We regarded them a way where they actually gave us that. The results are some that we could have never imagined. I think that's awesome. So it's learning to see beyond ourselves. 
So I'm going I'm to ask you to ask a question differently. Here's the, here's the question. Instead of asking, well, what problems have I solved today? I want you to ask, what problems have I caused today? A little bit different twist, right? So as you ponder that, take Ignaz Semmelweis. Ignaz Semmelweis was a European doctor and obstetrician in the mid-1800s. Ignaz was an interesting guy. He worked at Vienna General Hospital. He was a teaching, and it was a very important teaching and research hospital. And uh, Semmelweis also had a big problem, and that was that in his particular paternity ward, the mortality rate was higher than the other ward. I mean, significantly. So the death rate was 1 in 10. That's horrendous, isn't it? So he became obsessed with the problem, as he should. And what he ended up doing, he, he just he, he tried everything, every factor that he could try to equalize and normalize and, and you know, all the things that we do to, to see if we can't figure out what's the deal here. But to no avail, he could no significant difference with everything that he looked at. But then something happened. Semmelweis went on a four-month leave of absence, going over to visit another hospital. And no, when he returned, the rate had dropped significantly. I mean, it was not arguable. It was evidence. So why? Remember, I told you that this was an important teaching and research lab. And at that hospital, they did, uh, they, the doctors spent part of their time uh, research on cadavers and the other part of their time treating live patients, right? Well, he realized he was actually treating and, or, or doing research on or cadavers much more so than the other doctors. And so he concluded that particles were being transferred from cadavers to healthy patients on the hands of physicians. So he immediately instituted a policy and said, we will now be washing our hands in a chlorine lime solution before treating live patients. Significant drop in the mortality rate. Yay. All from one all from one, that's it, just one, quote, little thing. Well, it wasn't some earth-shattering new drug. It wasn't um, some earth-shattering new procedure or whatever. It was just simply washing your hands. So maybe... We're making this thing too hard. Maybe, just maybe, something like the feeling that we have for other staff, faculty, students, that they matter. Something like the feeling we create every day, every way, everywhere, that it matters. Because folks, there are no ruby red slippers, and I don't have them on today. There's no magic wand. There's no magic bullet. It doesn't cost a dime. Doesn't take any new money. It takes seeing beyond ourselves, where others matter first. Caring, feeling about other people is as simple as washing your hands. Thank you so much.
not the best dancer. I can do a lot of things, but. So Lander, thank you for your insightful look at the relationships as we as professionals and facilities truly, truly do impact student success, don't we? Give her a round of applause. I think the other thing that I can say too is I started an app in 2005. And if I look at Lander, she truly, truly helps us with our success at APA, right? I'm gonna get emotional. I think of when I met her, how inspirational she is, right? And how much she has given to this organization. So thank you for our organization. Thank you on behalf of myself, so. So as we head off to the last breakout session, just a reminder, I look forward to joining all of you this evening right here for our awards banquet at 545. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.